I thought this sermon was quite helpful, thinking about the benediction that we say at the end of every service. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm reading from the New International Version. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the Lord bless his words in our heart, in our heart. Amen. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We pray. Amen. We've been um, talking about worship with rejoicing, a sermon series that's based on the Old Testament readings from the lectionary at the moment, where we've been considering some of the events of David's life. But uh, now we continue, as we've continued through the, through the pattern of our worship on a Sunday, we started with a call to worship, then a call to confession, you remember that we did that just today. Maybe it wasn't quite the call to worship that you imagined. It wasn't a psalm. It wasn't some words. It was a beautiful prayer by Lucian. And then we called the whole world to worship as we sang praise uh, all people that on earth do dwell. And it wasn't quite loud enough for all the people on earth to hear it. But as you get better at singing hymns, all people on earth will hear you sing it. We carry on moving from that confession to this part of the service where we listen for a word from God, where we listen to the word of God and listen for a word from God as God speaks to our hearts. Then uh, you missed last week, but I'll send you the podcast I preached in Atlantis, but hope touched on it a bit. I'm sure uh, every service will, praying, interceding. And then this Sunday, the benediction, the blessing. And so David's story has been related to this that we've been looking at. This is now, uh, we've, we started with King David talking about building the temple. And we spoke about a call to worship as not necessarily a call to a place, but a call to, to uh, intimacy with God. Uh, Jesus calls us to come and rest a while with him. Then we spoke about that call to confession as he thought about David's sin and how David was, was tempted, perhaps maybe a bit naughty, mischievous, as he looked over his bungalow, over his balcony, to see Bathsheba taking a bath. We spoke about this call to confession when Nathan came to confront David on his sin, and David just simply confessed, and Nathan said, The Lord will not, you will not die. The Lord hears your prayers. We spoke about the Word of God and how it confronts us as Nathan spoke to David's heart and addressed what was happening. The part that you missed, but we'll still touch on it a bit, is the part about prayers of intercession. As we think about the story of the building of the temple, think about how David didn't build the temple, but Solomon was appointed later to do so. As God speaks to Solomon, he says of this temple space, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, 
Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We have journeyed through the chapters of our prayers to God this morning. We've journeyed from those prayers of praise to prayers for God to speak to us through his word. And we journey through that prayer just about every time we pray, even when we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven is a call to worship. Hallowed be thy name is a call to worship as we put ourselves in that position of, of obedience and prayer. Thy kingdom come is in one sense an intercession, but it is also a confession because I know that half the time I live on one or the other border of the kingdom of God and seldom live right inside the kingdom of God. And so when I say thy kingdom come, I pray particularly that I would live with God as my king. Then we start to get to the hard parts, the parts where we need the word of God to speak to us. Thy will be done. I want to know what you want for me, God. I need to know your will in this day and age, on earth as it is in heaven. I need the word. I need daily bread, but I also need to intercede that God would provide for me. Give us this day our daily bread. I need the strength of character, not just to, we focus so much on the forgiving us side of this part of the prayer, that we forget about the most difficult thing that Jesus calls us to pray for, is the courage to forgive others. I need God's daily bread to help me to have the courage to do that, because if I'm hangry, I will be grumpy and I won't forgive people. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Journey in, in every one of our prayers, I think, through that story, and eventually sent out with the blessing, with the benediction, to go out and bring change to the world. And so we, we've made it a bit of a habit sometimes, I think, and I'm even nervous to say it now, to read 2 Corinthians 13, verse 13, where it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, because as Methodists we get up and leave whenever we say that prayer. But it's not just a habit. It's not just, this is just tea, robust tea, by the way. I'd offer to make you some, but it's mine. It's nice on these cold days. It's a prayer that really concludes our whole service. It's a simple prayer that kind of says what we've been working towards since we got up and put our jackets on and came to church. You won't see me wearing this jacket on many other days than Sunday. I even tucked my shirt in today because I'm not wearing my robes, so you can't see my untucked shirt. I didn't iron my shirt, I have to confess, because I figured I'm wearing a jersey, so what are you going to see? But every time we gather to worship and pull ourselves together, it's, it's with the aim of leaving with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, of leaving with the love of God in our hearts and with the communion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It seems so unimportant because we tag it on at the end of every service, but it's what we've been working towards. I always enjoy uh, Eugene Peterson's way of interpreting the scriptures. He writes in his message version, in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 13. Mixed up there, verse 13. The numbers aren't quite the same in the message version. The amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ. The extravagant love of God. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. Be with all of you. That's why we gathered to worship, because we didn't have enough of that amazing grace in our lives. We were depleted and worn out like a cell phone that hasn't been charged for a while as we get to Sunday. And we come here to, to get our USB-C fast charging, whatever it is that we need, so that we will be re-energized with that amazing grace, with that extravagant love, and with that intimate friendship. Because we so badly need the power of the Trinity, this Trinity of grace, love, and friendship in our lives. As I think about this 
act of worshipping on a Sunday, I think of how my dad taught me not very well, I don't want to show off, not very well to splice ropes, and not fancy ropes like the one I'm going to show you, but very simple ropes. And I thought it was the most amazing thing that you could do, because you could take a rope, my dad liked fishing, so he liked all these kinds of things for tying boats up and stuff. You could take a rope and you could weave it together in such a way that it didn't look like it had a knot in it, but it had a lovely loop in the end of it. And the harder you pulled the rope, the less the loop would come out because the harder you pulled the rope, the more the strands would tighten together. And so it was like the most amazing kind of knot that you could tow a boat or a car with. And it made me think of the prayer of St. Patrick's breastplate, where St. Patrick prays in the... It's in a modernized hymn. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity. By invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three, of whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word, praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. I love that, that picture of binding this into myself, that, that picture of weaving or knitting maybe with three or four strands and holding together all of these aspects of God in ourselves. It made me think of you crafty people who might want to do some crafts, is, is print this prayer on a piece of paper, laminate it, put four holes or five holes in the bottom and tie, tie some knits, some, what's that stuff you knit with, wool onto the bottom. I would have done it, but it was at five o'clock this morning that I thought of this part of the sermon. I didn't. And then as you pray the prayer, you can just fold those little pieces of cord together and remind yourself that God is being found into your life as you worship and pray. And though one might prevail against another, we read in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. In Ecclesiastes, it's about friendship, but for us, let this be about friendship with the Trinity. As we worship, we knit ourselves together again after the world in which we live has frayed us apart. After the world in which we live has totally worn us out and made us feel quite exhausted, we hold ourselves together again with God's help. Anyways, the first part that we pray for is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is an interesting word. Its uh, root is a Greek word, charis, which means charity. It implies kindness. But we know that kindness or charity is not just a look of sympathy or a, a stay of execution. You know, when the parking meter gives you grace. Or when the... I, I, I time myself very carefully. I know that there's that grace between 60, 60 k's an hour and 65. Where if you're going at 64 kilometers an hour, you might not get a fine. That one. It's not that kind of grace. Grace is us accepting Christ's help in our need. And making Christ's helpfulness a part of our very being. Mostly, when you hear the word grace, we think of our sins forgiven, or we think of the grace period on our library books or our speeding fines. But the meaning of the English word for grace has changed over time. The word still holds its meaning when you talk about a ballet dancer moving with grace, or even this high jumper you've just been watching the Olympics. Look how she's smiling as she throws herself over the beam there. It's like there's an invisible hand helping her to get over the bar. And the funny thing I realized as I looked at the Olympic records is the, the world record for the highest jump is 2.45 meters. So somebody who does Olympic uh, belly flopping, whatever you call it, high jump, could jump over me with my hands in the air. Less good jumpers would get a little tickle as they went over. I'm not putting my hands up for the pole vaulty guy. Anyways. Grace 
is that invisible hand of God helping you to go. When you speak of a ballet dancer who just flies across the stage, they look like somebody's put them on ropes, but they're just standing on their toes going, ding, 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 ding. It's wonderful. Made me think of the way that I dance, and I like this quote. She danced like nobody was watching, but people were watching, and she looked like bees were attacking her. But when we talk about dancers and athletes moving with grace, we're speaking of them moving as if they have an invisible hand helping them. And so when we say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're not just saying, may God forgive us for all the mess-ups we're going to make. We're saying, may that invisible hand of God lift and carry me through the week ahead. May that invisible hand of God give me all the strength that I need to be the person that I need to be. So grace is not just forgiving. It's not just a second chance, but that is part of it. But it is God's invisible hand at work in our lives. And then love is just what we think it is. It is love, but it's not just love, boring old love. It's a more passionate and a stronger kind of love. One of my very dry Greek dictionaries speaks of the agape love as to have love for someone or something based on sincere appreciation and high regard. So that's what I say to my wife. I say, uh, I, I, I sincerely appreciate you and I regard you highly, my dear. Which is better than just normal philos kind of love, which is for me to say, I have love or affection for you based on association. My dear, I love you, based on association. We're stuck. <laughs> Agape is a, is a stronger kind of love. It's the kind of love that, 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 that is passionate and sincere and deep. And that's the kind of love we're talking about when we say the love of God. We're not asking for God to just love us by association. We're not asking to live in love by association. We're asking to live in love through deep appreciation and high regard, a more passionate kind of love. So we think of that prayer of St. Patrick, I bind unto myself this day the name, the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. That's what our whole service of worship is, binding these virtues, these, these characteristics into our hearts. We're listening to Jesus who said, come away to a deserted place all by yourself and rest for a while. We're doing that because the world has frayed us as ropes, as life. We're at the end of our rope, so to speak. We're feeling a bit worn out and weary. And God comes to take that tiny, frayed old strand of us and wrap that strand in his trinity of love, grace, and intimacy. So the third blessing that we ask is for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Our scripture this morning spoke of us not getting drunk with wine. And I'm sure none of you drink any wine because you're all very good Methodists. This really is tea, I promise. As Paul says, don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge drafts of Him. Sings hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. And sometimes I think maybe we've, we've lost our passion for the songs that we sing. I'm not kidding when I say I don't think all people that on earth do dwell will hear us when we sing those songs. I used to live near Newland Stadium. And I've got to tell you one trick that they did. Because the stadium would be empty and you could still hear the crowds because they had recordings to make the, the crowds sing louder. How's that for cheeky? I'll be like, there's no rugby today. But they were playing it back. But at those rugby matches, the whole stadium vibrates with enthusiasm as people shout for their team. And uh, I've, I've got some of you on a list that I want to put a little webcam on your TVs for when you watch the rugby. I think we could sell tickets to that show 
because it gets a little bit out of hand, I know. I'm not even inviting myself to watch because I'm not sure how Christian you are when you watch the rugby. But this, this passion, this joy and love of God that, that Paul is inviting us to, that, that can be compared to the kind of festivity that you get at a bar. I buy my curry next to a popular bar here in, in uh, Tableview. Very good curry. But when I go past the bar, I think to myself, that sounds like a lot more fun than church. Because everybody's like chatting and yelling and somebody's doing karaoke there. Making a hell of a racket and nobody's complaining because it's too loud, you know. Clacker. Why aren't we a bit more joyful and, and free and passionate in our worship of God? In Paul's day in big cities, there was not much drinking water. And if the Romans had Googled lead, they might not have used lead pipes. But if you were hot and worn out and you were working on the job, you couldn't grab an inner jade. You'd have to grab some fortified juice with a bit of fermented fruit in it or some beer. That would be what you could drink because anything that didn't have some alcohol in it would have, would have uh, given you some stomach bugs. The alcohol kept the water clean. So as people drank and drank even more water, they became a little more festive and a little bit more troublesome. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we're invited to drink of living water, of life-giving streams, of, of sobriety. But sobriety that, that is filled with joy in God the Holy Spirit. He lives within us, giving us energy within our very being to be the people that God has called and created us to be. We're invited to have this intimacy of relationship with God in this trinity of grace, love, and friendship. So we bind into ourselves the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Like our worn-out ropes, we go because we've come to this place of worship with the strength of God in our heart. Amen. I'm going to invite Alistair to come and lead us in our prayer.